Please join me in our opening prayer. God our Father, in love you sent your Son that the world may have life. Lead us to seek him among the outcasts and to find him in those in need. For Jesus Christ's sake, amen. Good morning to you all. And Happy New Year. It is 2023, so let us all resolve to live this year a life of purpose, of intention, serving God and our world. Let's all stand and we're going to sing together, We Three Kings. Please join me in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church here in Florence. I'm Dale Cohen, senior pastor, and on behalf of our associate, whom you've already heard from this morning, Reverend Dr. Terry Stubblefield, we're so glad that you're here today, and we want to extend to you the greeting of Happy New Year. Those of you who are joining us as online worshipers, we're grateful for your presence today as well, and I want to encourage you to participate along with us, just as if you were here in the building. Uh, we'll be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion today. And if you want to get some bread and juice and have it available for later in the service when we receive here in the sanctuary, we would love for you to participate at home as well. We'd also like to encourage those at home to go to fumcflow.org. That's our website. And there's a registration link you can click on there to let us know that you've been worshiping with us today. Or on Facebook in the comment section, uh, you can let us know there as well. Either way, we're grateful that you're with us, and what a great way to start a new year together. I want to encourage everybody here to take your uh, worship guide, and there's a little tear-off section there that has a connection card, and you can complete uh, that, and in just a few moments when the offering uh, is collected, you can drop that in the plate as it comes by. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're especially grateful for your presence today. I want to encourage you to, to share your information with us. We promise you we're not going to harass you or hound you, uh, but we would like to reach out uh, either via phone call, text, or email and just let you know how grateful that we are for your visit with us today. As I said, we're going to be receiving the Sacrament of Holy Communion today. And as Lisa read the invitation, it's Christ our Lord who invites to the table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sins. So what that tells you is that although this is a United Methodist Church, that what is extended to you does not belong to the United Methodist Church. It is Jesus Christ himself who extends the invitation. Therefore, you don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of any church. It's just those who earnestly desire to receive this gift of God's grace, who are welcome to come forward and to receive it when it's offered. 
So later in the service, when we get to that point and the ushers begin to direct people forward, um, I want to encourage everybody to come and to experience this symbol, this gift of God's grace. As far as calendar this week, the church office will be closed tomorrow, and there are no other activities throughout the week um, uh, as we normally do, but we'll resume our full Sunday morning and regular weekly schedule beginning next Sunday, January the 8th. Also, next Sunday, we'll worship at 8.15 and 11 a.m. with the Wesleyan Covenant Service. This is a traditional service that was instituted by John Wesley himself, the founder of the Methodist movement back in 18th century England. It's normally observed around the first of the year in which we recommit ourselves to following Jesus Christ as well as renew our baptismal vows. And so we'll be doing that at 8.15 and 11 next week. Due to the economic challenges of this past year, like many of you, the church experienced a difficult year fiscally. 2023 will likely be off to a slow start as well. However, many of you have attended faithfully, not only to the pledges that you made, but many of you went above and beyond in your giving as well. And we're so grateful for that. We're grateful for the generosity of this congregation. And as we prepare to receive the offering today, I want to invite Lisa to come forward and to offer a prayer of consecration for our gifts. Lisa? Thank you, Dale. Let's pray. God of grace and mercy, accept our tithe and accept our lives, both freely offered in gratitude for all you have done for us. Guide us in faithfulness to you and to our church through our commitment to you and to your church. We ask that you guide us through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness as we have committed. Guide us to give freely to you and your service through this church that you share with us. We ask that you use our gifts, our offering, and our lives wherever you might lead us to the glory and growth of your kingdom here on earth. In your most holy name I pray, amen.
standing for the gospel reading. The gospel reading is entitled, The Escape to Egypt. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all, all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. Then he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Out of your word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. It's hard not to feel let down after Christmas. John Walton, a Presbyterian pastor, noted how one year his neighborhood pharmacy removed all the Christmas decorations before they opened for business the next day. They replaced all the ornaments and trimmings with Valentine's Day trinkets and cards. Walton said this, nothing is as over as Christmas when it's over. The empty boxes and the pretty paper on the floor are all cleaned up, except for the stray tinsel from the tree the cat played with and left abandoned on the sofa. Life is back to normal, whatever that is, and it means that the diversion of the holidays, the frenzy and fuss, the lights and glitter, the pageantry and reverence are all packed away once again. And what's left, Walton asks, a brutal war in Ukraine, harsh winter storms with power outages and frozen pipes, homeless people sleeping on door stoops, hungry people begging for food, worry about our health, concern over our children's choices, and jobs that wear us down. We're back to where we left off before the holidays. We may ask out loud, who was that babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, left lying in a manger, and how will things change? because he came. Is Christmas really over? Or is it possible to make it last? As much as we love the idyllic manger scene of a babe in Bethlehem, the reality is that that peaceful image didn't last long. After the wise men came bearing gifts, Joseph learned in a dream that Herod the Great, the king of the Jews, having heard from the Magi about a newborn king in Bethlehem, was out to get Jesus. Mary, Joseph, and Jesus escaped to Egypt. The real world showed up for them in the harshest of ways. 
Matthew's gospel, what Lisa read for us just a moment ago, describes how King Herod ordered the execution of all the babies two years old and younger in and around Bethlehem to eliminate any competition for his throne. Imagine being threatened by a baby. Yet, Herod was. He was also a paranoid and insecure person who sent his brutal forces to kill an unknown number of innocent children, trying to protect the throne. Jesus escaped what has been called the slaughter of the innocents because of his father's spiritual sensitivity to God speaking to him in a dream and then his willingness to obey once again. Even though Herod exercised his authoritative will, there was no way that Herod could thwart the ultimate will of God. This awareness, well, it matters because what happened in Bethlehem is not an isolated incident in human history. Herod's slaughter of the babes of Bethlehem is reminiscent of how centuries earlier, Pharaoh worried that the Hebrew slaves were growing too numerous, and so he saw a senseless massacre of his own. Only the infant Moses escaped that time through a floating basket that in such an ironic way led Moses to live in the palace of Pharaoh. Making sense of Jesus becoming a refugee means making sense of our fallen world, which is vitally important. God is omnipotent. And what that means is that God is all-powerful. But God gives up his power to allow us to make choices for ourselves, to give us the freedom to choose. If God prevented our choices that result in pain and suffering for ourselves and for others, then we would no longer be free. Without freedom, we cannot choose to love God. And that's what God wants more than anything, is for us to choose, to freely choose to love Him. Therefore, the limits of what God can and cannot do are not set by logic or by some arbitrary boundary, his love sets the limits of what his love can and cannot do. Love is the founding principle of all that is. To say, as John did, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, well, that explains so much. And it shows that first and foremost, God loves us without reservation. Love demands freedom because true love can never be forced or coerced. A world where love is an option, unfortunately, will always be a world where pain and suffering are not only possible, but they're likely. And yet this world of choice founded on love is also what makes noble acts of self-sacrifice possible. This world is not only a world of pain and suffering, but because we can choose, it's also a world of generosity, kindness, and love. So if we want Christmas to last, I think that there are some some important lessons for us to learn. First, we live in a world where evil exists but we can only address the evil in ourselves. We can't change anybody else. And if you've tried, you know how frustrating that can be. Herod was a wretched and spiteful man who killed one of his wives and two of his sons because he thought they were out to get him. Is it any wonder he would slaughter hundreds, maybe thousands of innocent children to eliminate the one he perceived as a threat. We see a similar evil played out today in the warmongering of Vladimir Putin in Ukraine, who orders attacks on civilian targets and infrastructure. Or we see it in the despots of the Taliban, who dehumanize women. 
or in North Korea and China where dictators treat human lives as expendable commodities. Evil can only be countered by the good deeds of those who are committed to doing the loving thing. Therefore, we must eradicate all of the evil in ourselves first and find that place of love, that center of love out of which we must live. But then, we must also adopt and nurture a spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The problem is that even when we're committed to doing the loving thing, other people may react by lying, cheating, manipulating, distorting, inciting, and tearing people apart. The best we can do is set up boundaries that are designed to keep us as safe as possible, although that there is no guarantee that those who seek to do evil will respect those boundaries and may even violate those boundaries. Jesus' family established a boundary by taking him to Egypt where he would be safe until Herod died and they could return home. Years later, however, Jesus met other powerful boundary breakers who arrested him put him on trial using bogus charges and false witnesses, and executed him as if he were a criminal. They thought that they had rid themselves of him. However, little did they know that God could use their evil to accomplish God's good. God took the crucified body of Jesus, and he raised it from the dead, providing every one of us a way out of our brokenness and sinfulness with the promise of salvation. Jesus trusted God with his suffering and pain and trusted that God could redeem that for a greater good. And God came through. We can trust God in the same way. We don't have to fight God's battles. All we need to do is eradicate the evil in ourselves. If we want Christmas to last, we must be committed to doing the loving thing. We do this, as I said, first by eradicating any evil within ourselves, and second by doing the loving thing no matter what other people do. Finally, we trust God to redeem any suffering or retribution from doing the right thing because God can and will redeem all our suffering. But then, if we want to make Christmas last, we must also come to terms with the overwhelming nature of the struggle to make it last and to persevere again in love. It's not just the violence of the world that can be overwhelming. We see evil at so many levels. But we also see the needless suffering caused by greed and selfishness, often at the hands of people who think they are doing the right thing, but who have deluded themselves through their egotistical self-interests. We may feel as if the task of overcoming evil is greater than we can bear. I'm sure many of you have heard the story of the young girl walking along the beach where thousands of starfish were washed up during a terrible storm. When she came to a starfish, she would bend down, reach up, re reach out, pick up the starfish, and throw it back into the ocean. Well, as she did this, people felt like it was a, a futile effort, and they looked upon her with ridicule and scorn. Finally, a man approached her and he said, Little girl, why are you doing this? You can't possibly save all these starfish. You'll never make a difference because there are so many. The young girl initially was crushed and deflated. But after collecting her thoughts, she bent down, picked up another starfish, 
spread out into the ocean and turned to the man and said, I made a difference for that one. Well, the older man thought about what she said and started throwing starfish back into the ocean too. And others on the beach began to do it, and before you know it, there was not a single starfish left on the beach. She made all the difference. Jesus lived his entire life throwing starfish back into the sea, one by one. Starfish the Pharisees had written off as unworthy of being saved. And when Jesus extended the invitation for us to follow him, he wasn't asking us to save the entire world. That's not our task. He was asking us to reach out to those people that we encounter every day and represent God's love to them. So if we want Christmas to last, even though the task may feel overwhelming, we need to keep loving the people that God sends our way who need someone to be a living example of God's love for them. Finally, if we want to make Christmas last when we don't know what to do, just do what Jesus did. One of my favorite Christmas songs is the song, Love Came Down at Christmas. It was a poem originally written by Christina Rossetti, and I want to share two of the verses. In the first, she says, Love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine. Love was born at Christmas, star and angels gave the sign. Then in the final verse, love shall be our token. Now what does that mean? Love is the currency with which those of us who follow Jesus Christ interact with the world. Love shall be our token. Love be yours and love be mine. Love to God and others. Love for plea and gift and sign. What does that mean? Love for plea and gift and sign. Everything we ask for, everything we plead for, we plead for in love. Everything we give, we give in love. And through our pleading in love, through our giving in love, we become a sign to the world that indeed love came down at Christmas. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. This time we're going to turn our attention to the sacrament of Holy Communion, and I invite Terry to join me at the altar, and I invite you to follow along. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right. right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in, in the highest. Blessed, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your Word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body. Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Amen. I invite those who are going to assist to come forward at this time. And as they come forward, I want to let you know that the way we receive the sacrament here is Terry and I will be down here at the altar rail and we'll take a piece of bread, tear it off the, the loaf here, and then place it in your hand. And then you take the bread and dip it lightly in the grape juice and then consume uh, the, the bread that has been intincted with the wine. That's why we call it intinction. If for any reason you're uncomfortable with that, someone will be standing here in the center and we have these individual serving cups. Uh, the wafer is in the top and the juice is in the bottom and we don't want any barriers to the sacrament. We want you to experience this powerful symbol of God's love and God's grace. And you'll come forward when the ushers direct you.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may have noticed that I took some pictures with my cell phone while I was sitting up here. And we're casual today. This is so unmethodist. <laughs> but it is so lovely after Christmas and Advent with all that means to us. After New Year's Eve and the 47 bowl games that you're here today and that we can in love come together to worship our God. So may we all resolve this year to take the love of God, the saving grace of Jesus Christ to every person in every situation we find ourselves in. Amen.